Okay, well, um, thanks for having me tonight. Um, and just briefly before I get started, um, as Fiona said, I work for the Conserve Wildlife Foundation of New Jersey. If you're not familiar with us, um, we are a, a non-government or you know nonprofit organization. Our mission is to uh, protect, uh, monitor, and help recover our state's uh, at-risk wildlife that ranges from our smallest uh, salamanders and frogs um, up to eagles and raptors uh, and a lot of uh, species in between and as uh, she said in the introduction, um, this is my 30th year working with the beach nesting bird species. So I, I've chose to specialize in those coastal beach species. And um, I'm excited to share with you tonight kind of a new emerging thing that happened in the last couple of years. It's more or less unprecedented in here in New Jersey. Um, we've had some small islands uh, form in inlets, but this in this particular case, we have a a large island that it's formed just offshore, just outside of an inlet in southern New Jersey uh, that uh, provides habitat for shorebirds, both nesting and migratory. So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about how it all happened and what we did and sort of the challenges and what are the results of that. So, so with that, I will get started. And I'm going to start with this. Um, Greetings from the New Jersey Shore image. I think, um, I assume most of you or some of you at least uh, go to the Jersey Shore, um, or if not, you're pretty familiar with it. And this is probably more indicative of what we see a highly developed um, and recreated beach, um, crowded beaches. Um, of course, we have some more natural areas, but in general, this is the type of, uh, environment that our, what, that our wildlife that's in the coastal range, especially our beaches, has to deal with. And then we have this, which is Horseshoe Island. And by the way, we, we named it. It was new. Um, the island you can see is kind of in the shape of a horseshoe, uh, or it was. You'll see later in the program it's, it's morphed and changed in a short period of time. But um, so this island, just to give you an idea, is just north of Atlantic City and south of Long Beach Island, or if you're familiar with that, where Barnegat Light is. Um, so the island, if you see that is just outside that inlet, it's called the Little Egg Inlet. And on the picture on the right, um, you can get a little bit bigger um, view of it. And it's just offshore from what's called Little Beach Island which is part of the Edwin B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge. And that's a, the only island, barrier island in New Jersey that's not accessible to the public, not developed. There's no development on it. Um, it has a year-round closure um, for wildlife there. So the island is just offshore. It is actually not part of the refuge, however. Um, Lands that form in the coastal zone of New Jersey that accrete uh, belong to the state of New Jersey, or and sometimes we won't get too we won't get too deep in the weeds about the legal part, but um, or the adjacent landowner. But in this case, um, as a new title accreting land, it was under the jurisdiction of the state. So just to give you a, a little bit of an idea of. A bird's eye view that we took from an airplane. This is the bar in 2018. You can see Atlantic City in the background. So it's really not that far away as the crow or one of our birds flows, flies. And at that time, it was just starting to change from a, you know, like a, a tidal bar that at high tide would be underwater and then it would be exposed. And it had some value for wildlife then. Um, migratory birds would have been using it, but it wasn't high enough um, through the tide cycle that a bird trying to nest on the island um, nest wouldn't be flooded out. At the same time that it was forming as a bar and probably even a little bit before this, it also attracted um, recreational use as a place at certain tides that boats would land sort of their little um, private desert island. 
um, or in some cases a party island. There's, you know, some of these other ones around New Jersey like that. So, so that was something that um, plays heavily into the story today. So then the, the, a different view, the same angle looking, you can see uh, Atlantic City again in the south, it's a little hazier. This is now in 2001, a few years later, the bar is now um, pretty much a full-fledged island other than some um, storm tides and extreme high spring tides, it was above the overwash zone um, and seemed to be suitable for habitat. Um, I'm gonna actually go back, whoops, for a second. Our organization, the Conserve Wildlife Foundation, one of our major projects is to monitor the uh, endangered beach nesting bird on that little beach unit and directly to the north toll gate, which have the most piping plovers of anywhere in the state, which is a state and federally listed bird. And so we would be walking that island and be looking offshore. And for a number of years, again, we would just see that bar and we would see some birds out there, but it wasn't part of our task to monitor it. But as time went on, a couple things were happening that sort of point um, that of that a little beach that points almost straight, sticks out towards the island. When we would get to be there and we were monitoring it, we were over time seeing less and less birds using that area. And when we looked across, we were starting to notice even that the island is only about a thousand um, yards or so offshore. You can actually hear the birds from the shoreline of the mainland. Um, we would notice that some of the oyster, American oyster catchers, one of the larger birds that you can see pretty easily, we noticed them over there and we started to realize they were probably nesting. So once the island reached this side, um, we were pretty sure, but again, it wasn't part of our regular um, tasks that we were contracted to do to uh, monitor the island, but we decided to take a, a boat out anyhow and find out what we saw. And we did actually confirm that at, at that point um, that there were nesting birds. So that was sort of an important change. That was the summer of 2021. We monitored best we could, uh, not as thoroughly as probably we would have liked, um, but we wanted to be able to document at least some of that initial colonization of the island by um, nesting birds. And so I just actually want to. Um, now jump back again to the island. Um, this is a really neat view, uh, again, from an airplane, or this was a helicopter actually, um, of the island in 2023. So it's changed again. Uh, you can kind of see on the right-hand side, the, um, the original horseshoe, it has sand wrapped all around it and extending south now. Um, and that was last year. And I will, will tell you it's changed yet again, but it was getting bigger. It was maybe only 50 to 100, um, 50 acres or so of upland above tide area that first couple of years, and now it's doubled or tripled in size. I'm just trying to give you the whole range of how the islands changed. Oh, how did how did the island like it? Obviously, it's adding sand. Where's the sand coming from? It is natural. Um, I should put natural in quotes. Um, there are, the bars are, it's not uncommon to have bars and sometimes small islands near these inlet, uh, habitats, uh, or inlet areas. However, directly to the north, uh, the beaches since Hurricane or Superstorm Sandy have been receiving millions of cubic yards of sand as part of a beach nourishment project to maintain the, um, width and the flood protection of those beaches. Sand in this um, system here moves from the north to the south, it drifts. So as the sand is uh, washed away from the island to the north, eroded or just natural processes, it's starting to deposit here um, in, in the inlet more and more. And, and it's sort of like a, sort of a building up, the more the island is there, at least for now, um, it's growing exponentially now at this point. You can kind of see the offshore, um, those white caps, that's because there's bars um, offshore. There's more sand out there, and that's sort of continually attaching to the island over time. 
So when we went out there and checked out birds and just in generally, just so you understand, when we talk about beach nesting birds in New Jersey, we're primarily talking about these four species. Upper left top is um, the piping plover. It's our most at risk nesting bird, beach bird. There's only about 120 pairs in the state on average each year. Um, it's state endangered and also federally threatened. So it's um, a listed species in its entire range. Uh, we have a particularly small population in here in New Jersey. Uh, top right is the black skimmer. That's a state endangered bird. Bottom right, a least turn, another state endangered bird. And then the bottom left is an American oyster catcher. That's what we uh, is classified as a species of special concern. It's not considered quite as at risk as the others, um, but it often nests with the others and it's subject to the same uh, risk factors. And so we can sort of help protect them at the same time we're protecting these other birds. I did want to note an um, important part of the story, although we hoped that we would be able to add another nesting site um, for piping plovers at Horseshoe. Um, for the first couple of years, we have not had um, piping plovers nesting there. So a little bit of a disappointment, but it's provided such exceptional and important habitat for all these other species that um, we can hardly complain about that. So. And there's a, that's a developing story too that I'll talk about a little in a little bit. So, so there are the species we were hoping would use use. And when we went out there in that 2001 for some quick checks, indeed, all, all of those three species were um, nesting there. So that that was exciting news for us. So one of the other things I just want to point out, in addition to at least if there's not a lot of boaters landing. Uh, the habitat being disturbance-free or minimized, you know, less disturbance, it also has no mammalian predators. In New Jersey, the biggest risks, one of the biggest risks to these birds is um, predation of their eggs, um, their chicks, and sometimes the adults. Predators range to fox and coyote, raccoons, cats closer to um, developed areas, crows goal so it's it's a long list of um, potential predators that are also they're very common and their their um, populations are growing so the right off the bat a huge advantage of this island is no mammals no fox out there and and the adjacent land the little beach in Holgate fox and coyotes have been one of the largest um, predators in the last couple of years so huge bonus it is more at risk for overwash and flooding. The birds are willing, this is sort of, they're a high risk species. They're willing to take that chance because of the lack of predators. So once we confirmed there was species out there and there was boat landing out there, um, we really had to make a big decision from the get go. Um, and that is, share the shore or not. I, I use the word share the shore. That's kind of a um, a term we, we use. Um, the vast majority of our birds are nesting on areas that are open to the public. Um, the beaches can be crowded. Um, they aren't doing well. And one of the reasons is, is the birds are highly um, prone to disturbance by humans for a number of factors. I'm not going to get a super deep dive into that, but on the most basic level, they can get trampled or run over. And then all the shore towns manage their beaches. They clean them with machines. They pick up garbage. They drive on them for lifeguard services. All of those things can run over the birds or the nests if they're not protected. Um, and then there's indirect impacts. We're on the beach. We leave trash on the beach. That attracts predators. There's more predators near the nests on these recreational beaches. So, you know, there was a lot of debate whether we have experimented with another smaller island in uh, Cape May County where we did some sharing, some landing was allowed in a recreational zone. It had very mixed results. Um, and so we made a huge decision that we were going to try to limit the human use on the island. Um, over 95, it's closer. It, Closer, even higher than that of the beaches in New Jersey. 
do have public use. So it wasn't like we were um, totally excluding you, you know, public use from across the state. It was a small area and we deemed it important enough that we would uh, try that as our um, main management um, for human disturbance. And so even though, and I should say we, this is where the partnership comes in. We do our monitoring for the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Edwin B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge. And even though they don't own the land, they have a stake in it. It's adjacent to their properties, um, as well as the New Jersey uh, Fish and Wildlife it has an endangered and non-game species program. So after that first uh, year of 2021, where we, we confirmed the birds were nesting there, and, and pretty large numbers, by the way, um, we decided that that we would do this, but we don't own the land. And in New Jersey, the Tidelands Research Council are the ones that um, have jurisdiction over tidal lands, including these accreting areas like I talked about earlier. So we um, developed a management plan and proposal and had to go before them and request that we could manage the land and we were going to do that um, through a seasonal closure of the island uh, from March 1st to September 30th. Uh, there'd be no public access to the island. It would be for wildlife and birds only. Um, we had actually initially hoped to and requested even a longer period. There was some, you know, you, you make a proposal and then it is discussed by the council. There's uh, some back and forth. There's a public component to it. And so in the end, they did grant us, um, and in this case, that they granted it to the Fish and Wildlife Service, but we continue to partner to do all the monitoring and management um, to for five-year period. So um, we have, it's going to be in effect for five years, and I'll talk about what happens after five years in a bit. Okay, for some reason, my screen is not moving forward now, so. Hmm. Okay, there we go. So, you know, just thing I wanna bring up, you know, the closure is effective, it hasn't been effective, but it is really challenging to enforce, um, you know, it's the, even though it's just offshore, um, we have to boat out there. We can't be there 24 seven, um, even though we're sharing it with the fish and wildlife, the monitoring duties. They also, we have limited resources. We do hire seasonal employees through the summer um, to monitor our nesting birds, beach nesting birds throughout the state. Still, it's a very small staff. So we, first year we were sort of tried to do it um, using just those staff. Um, it was partially effective, but not as effective as we would have liked. And so we were able to um, include or, or get in as a partner. New Jersey has a um, wild, an enforcement unit for their wildlife, um, fish and wildlife. And so they partnered or came in and we worked together so that they could also assist us. And that's been way much more effective as you can imagine. Just to give you an idea, you know, like there's unlimited places they could land and, you know, some days um, in that first year before we had a, a full um, program in effect, there was quite a few people out there at times, including, you know, they go out there, they were partying to some degree, they had dogs out there running loose, which are a huge threat to the animals, they can trample the um, nests, the dogs will chase the young when they're born. So. In most areas where we have beach nesting birds, whether it's on an island like this or not, um, pets, uh, pr primarily dogs, are prohibited from being on the beach. So, you know, how did we do this? We did, you know, uh, again, we had our staff out there when they could be. They're not out there, like I said, 24-7, but we, you know, we signed the various areas. Um, we put a perimeter, uh, signs around the perimeter indicating it was closed. We have this with uh, information um, you can scan for more information. We did a lot of outreach and that's one of the advantages of having multiple, multiple partners, um, US Fish and Wildlife Service and New Jersey Fish and, Wild Fish and Wildlife. Um, 
we could pick up the slack. We have a large following um, on social media and through other means that we could help them sort of promote the idea that it was posted to the public at this time. So, you know, we uh, that's where the outreach to the public um, about the importance of the site to nesting and migratory birds. Uh, we are one of our goals was to increase our presence at the island, island to educate the public, um, especially during that recreational area period. And then again, you know, to correct and monitor the wildlife, both by being present keeping the signs up and just trying to monitor whether they're being successful out there. So uh, just to give you an idea, I'm going to use initially some cute little schematics we have. Um, the island was more or less filled uh, with nesting of some sort in that first year in 2022. The blackbirds with orange uh, beaks uh, represent the American oyster catcher. These are territorial nesting birds, so you'll notice that they're not right next to each other. So they're generally spread out as would um, piping plovers if they were nesting on the island. Whereas the skimmers and the terns that you see on the right area are what we call colonial nesters. So there can be anywhere from a couple pairs to, in this case, hundreds of pairs on the island in densely packed into an area in many cases. Um, and one of the reasons is, um, so the, the colonial species, for one thing, um, their foraging behavior is they fly, so at least turns will fly and um, basically grab fish out of the ocean or the bay or that back shore area, that, the waters you see in the, the back of the photo. Um, same with the skimmers, a little bit different, but again, so their foraging is far away, whereas the oyster catchers are getting food nearby, um, as would piping plovers. Um, so they're competing more for the resor foraging resources that are right there or close to the island. So they, they don't, they don't want to go as far away. They're not um, usually as successful at raising their chicks if they have to fly you know, 10 miles away to get food. So just in general, um, that's kind of like a really sort of a basic way of explaining why some of these birds are territorial and some can nest right next to each other. I just want to give you, um, you know, some cool pictures, pretty pictures. Um, so this is on the top. This is the black skimmer with its chick that's a couple of weeks older, and then on the right. That's what it would look like when it reaches its fledgling stage, which is a month or so. Um, and so when I use the word fledgling, that's when they reach the stage where they can fly. Um, and that's how we measure the success, not by the number of chicks. Of course, the number, if they hatch a number of chicks, a lot of chicks, more chicks, they're more likely in most cases to be able to fledge more um, young. So the hatching is important, but ultimately, our barometer for success is the number of chicks that reach that fledgling or flying stage. I will say, just as an aside, unfortunately, with many of these species, the rec the um, survival that first year, even after they reach the stage where they can fly, might be 50% um, as far as returning um, or surviving that first year. So you need to create a lot of fledgling um, if you're going to bolster your even to keep your population um, stable, but to grow your population recover, which again, remember is our uh, goal. Uh, we have to produce a lot of fledgling. The, I, the fledgling, in most of these species, the birds tend to return to their natal where they were born or close to where they're born. So again, I'm oversimplifying a little tonight, but um, the way you grow your population is you produce more of these fledgling. And then on the bottom, um, we have royal terns. And um, again, just uh, just some cool pictures of royal terns. Royal terns are really special. Um, we ha have very few nesting royal terns in New Jersey historically. And I'll, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk more about them. But they're not part of our normal mix of beach nesting birds in New Jersey. I didn't include them on that initial picture that I had. So I'm gonna, I don't usually do videos, but we we did some really cool videos of the colony. We 
place some cameras out there that we could uh, track human use, predator issues, and also for education um, that we could have um, some uh, videos to show you what it's like. So this one, of course, our camera, this particular camera isn't on the most densely part of, part of the colony, but we have royal turns and mostly, and I'm just going to give you an idea of kind of the raucousness of the uh, colony. So hopefully this works. coming forward for the turns, royal turns. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that. It's pretty cool. I have one more video at the end to show you as well. So, um, so what I want to talk about, I want to tell you, so, you know, what's the results of all this? Did it work? And, um, you know, from our point of view, it's it's been a pretty big success. Um, every year has been a little bit different. We're in our, uh, officially, we're in our third year uh, of right now of the monitoring. Um, and so every year, this is the northernmost colony of rural terms in the entire hemisphere, and it's growing each year. Um, we had less than 100 pairs the first year, and last year we had over 400, just over 400 pairs. So um, right there, um, and they've done moderately well as far as, far as fledglings. Um, we've had periods of uh, flooding on the island, and it's kind of a timing thing. Sometimes it's early enough that they can re-nest other times, because um, the birds will re-nest if their earlier nests fail. Other times it's been at a really inopportune time where um, they've already hatched young or it's too late in the season to re-nest and we end up losing part or in one case, all of the birds in one of the colonies. So, but again, I already told you this, these are high risk um, species. They don't need to be successful every year to, to be successful long-term. Some of these um, like the oyster catchers are long lived species they can live um 15 to 20 years so as long as they're producing young in some or at least a majority of those years um it's fine we in, in a normal situation it's expected there'll be some down years is what i'm trying to say um the uh, skimmer skim black skimmers in the bottom and again they're a state endangered species um we had the largest black skimmer colony in new jersey in 2023 the most productive one year, we had about 400 fledglings from that. You know, close to uh, more than or close to a thousand birds we're talking about with the skimmers. Um, it's varied slightly from year to year. Presently, this year we already have um, at least um, a thousand birds there, so it's quite spectacular. Um, largest least turn colony in one of our years. And again, this year, it looks like it's our largest colony. The least turns have been the, no pun intended, but they have been the least successful of our turn species at the island. We don't understand quite why, um, but they have been subject to some, quite a bit of flooding. They tend to be on a lower portion of the island. There is high competition for the different zones of the island. It's pretty low lying, but there definitely are some higher spots that some of the species are able, they're more aggressive and maybe get um, more than the others. And then the American oyster catchers have gone from six to 10 to 12 to 16 pairs this year. I'm including that 2001 um, year where we had unofficial monitoring because the increase of this, this bird has just been um, tremendous in the few years. And in 2022, they had the highest productivity or number of chicks fledged again of any spot in New Jersey, major um, site in New Jersey, one chick per pair versus just a, on average a third when you took all the pairs for the state divided by the number of chicks. So three times the average that year. 
Um, and just as one of the examples, unfortunately, last year, and fingers crossed, because it was just about now, uh, about a week later, um, a strong uh, storm hit New Jersey, washed overwashed the entire island for three couple days, and most of the oyster catcher nests had hatched, and all the chicks were washed away. So none of them survived from the twelve pairs. Uh, compared to the previous year when there was quite a few that survived. So we, tomorrow actually is our first um, chick, chick or chicks will fledge um, oyster catcher chicks from the island. So we'll at least get something out of it this year. And if we were able to get through the next couple of weeks, we'll have a pretty successful year for those birds. Can't say for the rest. They're so when you hear those hurricane uh, predictions um, are many people on the coastal zone. They worry about their homes and as they should be and um, their beach. And we're worrying about our birds. Um, we're, they're predicting higher than average hurricane storm season this year. And we already are in storm season. So we'll, it'll be a nail biter for us, basically. Just wanted to point out, I've been talking about the nesting birds and um, one of our goals here was also to protect the island for migratory and non-breeding birds. Um, sometimes the breeding birds get a little bit more of the attention, um, but in truth, there are a lot of migratory birds that stop over in New Jersey, both during their northbound or southbound migration. Shorebirds such as red knots and some of the other um, banderlings, donlin, are going to be flying to the Arctic and sub. Arctic regions of North America to breed. They, they're, that happened, the peak of that happened from early March to early June. So we just completed that period and the island would have been at some times up, if not full, I had quite a few shorebirds. Just like the breeding birds, they benefit from uh, a habitat that does not have mammalian predators when they're um, roosting or sleeping at night, they're at risk, but also human disturbance. Um, when these birds uh, reach our shores from South America, for instance, they're usually um, pretty weak. Uh, they've lost a lot of weight. They're here to rest for anywhere from a couple days to a couple weeks, gain weight back, and then move on um, to their breeding ground. So and then in reverse, this is, you know, they have a long flight back. It's a little more leisurely on the way back, but um, again, they need, it's critical for shorebirds to have safe disturbance-free stopover sites. And this site provides that for us. So that was part of the impetus of the, um, the long closure season from March 1st all the way through September 30th. And yeah, so some of the species, roseate tern, are not nesters here. They are nesters in the Northeast. They're another federally listed species. Um, we had a peak of 11 there last year, and that does not seem like much, but that is the highest number, I believe, recorded in one location in New Jersey, historically, or at least in decades. So, um, so we'll see. Um, and some of those could have easily detected uh, our own observation. Keep in mind, these are just peak counts when we were out there doing our monitoring. We're not out there 24-7, as I mentioned. So there, there could just as well be many more um, there at other times. Um, red knots, the mentioned that are federally listed um, and state listed as well. We've had approximately 500 there. That is a, a large number and important. So that this is a um, critical habitat for this bird. Um, so piping plovers, um, we do have migratory short uh, piping plovers that we record here in New Jersey. And so we've had a peak of at least 16 there. So that's a big number. Pelicans, um, approximately 200. That is also the most recorded in one location in New Jersey. So um, we're, we were thinking about even those, those birds initially. Uh, Royal terns, I mentioned they nest there and it was about 400 pairs, but we had over 1,400 or about 1,400 royal terns in addition to our breeders that are using that area. And many of them were banded. And so we were able to tell where they were coming from. The, uh, many, many of the, some terns such as royal terns will move um, north. So I mentioned um, 
we were the northernmost uh, colony here, and the other colonies tend to be, you know, all be south of us. So Maryland, Virginia, and then in the Carolinas and further south, many more. But they they will move north, um, disperse north after breeding, and um, large numbers were using this island as their uh, migratory or staging area. And then just across the board, he has some numbers, uh, a couple hundred to thousand um, other uh, migratory shorebirds are using the site. So their peak at one time, um, again, uh, over time, there's many more than that. So um, with that in mind, I wanted to kind of shift to that. That's sort of like a, a general summary of what's going on in the island, but what's new? And I'm gonna say got plovers. So um, for all those years wishing we would have plovers this year, just in the last couple of weeks, we had our first piping plover nest. So this is exciting news for us. It's only one pair right now. There's possibly a second pair at the island. Um, we hope to maybe confirm that as early as tomorrow, although it's getting late in the season for new pairs to be um, settling in. But we've had a, a prospecting additional male at least out there, and we're hoping that it was able to find a female. So again, one, one pair doesn't seem like much. I mentioned only about 120 pairs. Any new site is important when we have such a small population. And again, um, at least in theory or conceptually, they could do well better here than on a populated beach. Piping plovers in particular are a tough uh, bird. It's tough to nest on a recreational beach for them. When the chicks are born and there's that chick in the bottom right, that's a couple day, one day or two days old that just left the nest bowl. The nest on the left, that's a piping plover nest. You can see the eggs, the chicks, the adults, they all blend into the um, sand. They use that for camouflage. Um, the, the adults never feed the young for piping plovers. The chicks are on their own. And again, in quotes, the adults are there to protect them and um, guide them, but they don't feed them. Like we're very used to seeing um, like robins that feed their young. But these birds are built for speed. They have long legs. Um, they're going to go to the intertidal zone, so the area at the edge of uh, where the ocean and the beach meet, especially a low tide, when the um, when the sand, wet sand, is exposed. There's marine invertebrates that the plovers are pecking are pulling out of there. And so, just you know, whether you've been to the beach or not. Um, the area people want to be, um, well, especially on a hot summer day, they want to be in the water, near the water. In the morning, they're going to walk their dog along the water's edge. And so that's the area the birds need to get to to survive. And in those situations where there's so much human activity where they need to feed, we do have high mortality because they basically starve to death. Um, you know, but it, <laughs> it's high mortality. Um, due to uh, you know, lack of foraging opportunities. So this, these kind of habitats, these protected habitats where there's not human disturbance are especially um, beneficial to piping plovers. So that's the, that's the exciting news. It literally just happened between um, like uh, when, you know, the last couple of weeks. So the other thing, change is constant, change is good. We always, you know, we hear some of these terms. This is the island, uh, just, uh, I don't, this year, a couple months ago, it's changed it again. To the bottom left, there's a new um, spit that's forming. And instead of having one lagoon, you can see there's now two lagoons. And the way it's going is that spit that's forming in the bottom left uh, is going to continue to the top and probably reconnect. And then we'll have three lagoons by next year. So. Um, the fact that it's changing is good generally, but it, it means it's unpredictable and um, it could also lose sand, we, we realize, so that we're trying to always figure out what, what's in store for us. And just to give you an example of how these changes come into play, in 2001, that first, uh, or 2002, the first year we were monitoring the island officially, you can see the arrow, there's a bar offshore. The bar was not high enough all the time um, for nesting to occur. There was shorebird use and pelicans and, out there and other, other migratory birds. But at that point, we had committed to, um, even though we 
were given the rights to manage the bar in the vicinity as well. We left it that first year to focus on the um, nesting birds. And you can kind of see in the picture up there, so the boats, instead of they landing on the island when they learned they couldn't, they were landing on the bar. So it kind of gave us uh, sort of a compromise in the short term. Um, but uh, by the following year, that bar had attached to the island. And so with just a small, narrow gut in between, and nesting started occurring there. And there was more shorebird use. So we basically don't have that option now. Um, so it's a it's a pretty much like a no-go period out there. There's there's not an option where the boats can land and sort of they could be happy. Boaters could be happier. And it kind of made our job easier the first year. And so I just, I'm just bringing up, this is not, you know, a stable situation. It's changed. The coast is always changing. And so our management has to adjust to keep up with those changes. And then lastly, um, you know, as far as what's what's in the you know future, what's new. So the resource council agreement expires after the 2026 season. So we have two more full seasons. Um, at this time, we we plan to seek a renewal or a new agreement. But you know, we we do need to demonstrate that the seasonal closure was effective and justified, and that it provided benefit to the wildlife, um, especially the at-risk species um, that sort of outweighs the you know, the lost uh, recreational opportunity. Um, and I, I think we'll be able to do that, but, you know, it's not guaranteed the board does a vote. Um, the members and um, the public is going to weigh in on that too. So, but um, we think uh, we, at this time, we think we can demonstrate that um, it's been greatly beneficial to the members. And again, they're at-risk species, they're listed species. They do have, um, sort of special status um, that, that gives them, you know, a, gives us, you know, that to rest on. Okay, and then I thought before we did a short uh, question and answer, I'd try to show you another video. This one's a little more of the Zen version instead of the raucous one. Um, if you keep your eye on the two birds in the lower, uh, adults in the lower left, you can easily already see there's a chick there. It's just to give you a little, Little chick moment. So, uh, you know, that video, you can see it's, uh, it's so different than the first one, which was, like I said, was pretty loud and busy. But um, a couple things about that, you can see how gentle the adults can be with their chicks. Um, it looked like the adult was feeding the young right at the beginning. But also, like, when there's not a lot of human disturbance at the site, the, the colonies, you know, do settle and can be calm, and they really do need that um, uh, kind of environment if they're going to be successful. Um, for those of you that are, um, you know, you're intrigued by those videos or the talk, if you want to do a deeper dive, um, you'd have to listen to me in part again because I'm in it um, for a short period. But we, there's a, like a 10 minute video that um, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, New Jersey Fish and Wildlife produced about the island. It covers some of the same information we call covered today, plus some really cool footage. So. Um, the easiest way, since this isn't a hot link, if you say Horseshoe Island, New Jersey, um, and you click on that, the YouTube video pops up um, as one of the first options. And then the um, Fish and Wildlife Service, New Jersey Fish and Wildlife, excuse me, does maintain um, a section on the website about the island. It includes more details, the management agreement, um, how it's written and all that, those kind of details. It's at least up to date to last year, one of our, um, we do have to produce a report each year about the results. So those reports are in there. Um, so if you're really interested, go to it. Um, 